Hello. So today I'm going to do a reading on the Mahasihanada Sutta, the great discourse on the lion's roar. And this is translated by Nandamo Litera and Bhikkhu Bodhi. And um, today we're at the Buddha Center. Let's just look around here. Um, and this is where we're going to be recording the the reading today. So without further ado, um, let's just get right into it. Here we go. The Maha Sihanara Sutta. The Great Discourse on the Lion's Roar. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Vesali in the grove outside of the city to the west. Now on that occasion Sunakatta, son of the Lichi, Li, Lichavis, had recently left this Dhamma and discipline. He was making this statement before the Vesali assembly. The reckless Gotama does not have any superhuman states, any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. The reckless Gotama teaches a Dhamma merely hammered out by reasoning, following his own line of inquiry as it occurs to him. And when he teaches the Dhamma to anyone, it leads him, when he practices it, to the complete destruction of suffering. Then, when it was morning, the venerable Sariputta, dressed and taking his bow and outer robe, went in to Visali for alms. Then he heard Sunakatta, son of the Lichavis, making this statement before, before the Visali assembly. When he had wandered for alms in Visali and had returned from his alms round, after his meal he went to the Blessed One and after having paid homage to him, he sat down at one side and told the Blessed One what Sun Sunna Katta was saying. And the Blessed One said, Sariputta, the misguided man Sunna Katta, is angry, and his words are spoken out of anger. Thinking to discredit the Tathagata, he actually praises him. For it is a praise of the Tathagata to say of, of him. When he teaches the Dhamma to anyone, it leads him, when he practices it, to the complete destruction of suffering. Sariputta, this misguided man, Sunakatta, will never infer of me according to the Dhamma. That blessed one is accomplished, fully enlightened perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. And he will never infer of me according to Dhamma. That blessed one enjoys the various kinds of supernormal power, having been one, he becomes many. Having been many, he becomes one. He appears and vanishes. He goes unhindered through a wall, through an enclosure, through a mountain, as, as though through space. He, he dives in and out of the earth as though it were water. He walks on water without sinking as though it were earth. Seated cross-legged, he travels in space like a bird. With his hand, he touches and strokes the moon and sun so powerful and mighty. He wills bodily mastery even as far as the Brahma world. 
and he will never infer of me according to the Dhamma, with divine ear with the divine ear element, which is purified and surpasses the human, that blessed one hears both kinds both kinds of sounds, the heavenly and the human, those that are far as well as near. And he will never infer of me according to Dhamma. That blessed one encompasses, encompasses is with his own mind the minds of other beings, other persons. He understands a mind affected by lust as affected by lust and a mind unaffected by lust as unaffected by lust. He understands a mind affected by hate as affected by hate and a mind unaffected by hate as unaffected by hate. He understands a mind affected by delusion as affected by delusion and a mind unaffected by delusion as unaffected by delusion. He understands a contracted mind as a contracted mind and a distracted mind as distracted. He understands an exalted mind as exalted and an unexalted mind as unexalted. He understands a surpassed mind as surpassed and an unsurpassed mind as unsurpassed. He understands a concentrated mind as concentrated and an unconcentrated mind as unconcentrated. He understands a liberated mind as liberated and an unliberated mind as unliberated. The Ten Powers of a Tatak the ten powers of a Tathagata. Sariputta, the Tathagata, has ten. Let me start over on this one. Sariputta, the Tathagata, has these ten Tathagata's powers, possessing which he claims the herd leader's place, roars his lion's roar in the assemblies and sets rolling the wheel of Brahma. What are the ten? Here the Tathagata understands as it actually is the possible as possible and the impossible as impossible. And that is a Tathagata's power that the Tathagata has by virtue of which he claims the herd leader's place, roars his lion's roar in the assemblies and sets rolling the wheel of Brahma. Again, the Tathagata understands as it actually is the, the results of actions undertaken, past, future and present, with possibilities and with causes. That too is a Tathagata's power. Again, the Tathagata understands as it actually is the ways leading to all destinations. And that too is a Tathagata's power. Again, the Tathagata understands as it actually is the world with its many and different elements. That too is a Tathagata's power. Again, the Tathagata understands as it actually is how beings have different inclinations. That too is a Tathagata's power. Again, the Tathagata understands as it actually is the disposition of the faculties of other beings the persons. That too is a Tathagata's power. 
again. The Tathagata understands as it actually is the defilement, the cleansing and the emergence in regard to the jhanas, liberations, concentrations and attainments. That too is the Tathagata's power. Again, the Tathagata recollects his manifold past lives, that is, one birth, two births, three births, four births, five births, ten births, twenty births, thirty births, forty births, fifty births, a hundred births, a thousand births a hundred thousand births, many eons of world concentration, many eons of world expansion, many eons of world concentration and expansion. There I was so named of such a clan, with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my life term, and passing away from there, I reappeared elsewhere. And there too, I was so named, of such a clan, with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my life term, and passing away from there, I reappeared here. Thus, with their aspects and particulars, he recollects his manifold past lives. That too is a Tathagata's power. Again, with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, the Tathagata sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, and he understands how beings pass on according to their actions thus. These worthy beings who were ill-conducted in body, speech and mind, revilers of noble ones, wrong in their views, give an effect to wrong view in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death have reappeared in a state of deprivation, in a bad destination, in perdition, even in hell. But these worthy beings, who were well conducted in body, speech and mind, not revilers of noble ones, right in their view, given effect to right view in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death have reappeared in a good destination even in the heavenly world thus with the divine eye which is purified and surpasses the human he sees beings passing away and reappearing inferior and superior fair and ugly fortunate and unfortunate, and he understands how beings pass on according to their actions. That too is the Tathagata's power. Again, by realizing it for himself with direct knowledge, the, Tathag the Tathagata here and now enters upon and abides in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that he that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. That too is a Tathagata's power that a Tathagata has, by virtue of which he claims a herd leader's place, roars his lion's roar in the assemblies, and sets rolling the wheel of Brahma. The Tathagata has these ten Tathagata's powers, possessing which he claims the herd leader's place, 
roars, his lions roar in the assemblies, and sets rolling the wheel of Brahma. Sariputta, when I know and see thus, should any one say of me, the recluse Gotama does not have any superhuman states, any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. The recluse Gotama teaches a Dhamma, merely hammered out by reasoning, following his own line of inquiry as it occurs to him. Unless he abandons that assertion and that state of mind and relinquishes that view, then, as surely as if he had been carried off and put there, he will wind up in hell. Just as a bhikkhu possessed of virtue, concentration and wisdom should here and now enjoy final knowledge, so it will happen in this case, I say, that unless he abandons that assertion and that state of mind and relinquishes that view, then, as surely as if he had been carried off and put there, he will wind up in hell. Four kinds of intrepidity Sariputta The Tathagata has the, these four kinds of intrepidity, possessing which he claims the herd leader's place, roars his lion's roar in the assemblies, and sets rolling the wheel of Brahma. What are four? Here I see no ground on which any recluse, or Brahman, or God, or Mara, or Brahma, or anyone at all in the world, could, in accordance with the Dhamma, accuse me thus. While you claim full enlightenment, you are not fully enlightened in regard to certain things. And seeing no ground for that, I abide in safety, fearlessness and intrepidity. I see no ground on which any recluse, Brahman or God or Mara or Brahma or anyone at all could accuse me thus. While you claim to have destroyed the taints, these taints are undestroyed by you, and seeing no ground for that, I abide in safety, fearlessness and intrepid intrepidity. I see no ground on which any recluse or anyone at all could accuse me thus. Those things called obstructions by you are not able to obstruct obstruct one who engages in them. And seeing no ground for that, I abide in safety, fearlessness and intrepidity. I see no ground on which any recluse or anyone at all could accuse me thus. When you teach the Dhamma to someone, it does not lead him when he practice it, practices it to the complete destruction of suffering, and seeing no ground for that, I abide in safety, fearlessness and intrepidity. A Tathagata has these four kinds of intrepidity, possessing which he claims the herd leader's place, roars, his lion's roar in assemblies, and set rolling the wheel of Brahma. Sariputta When I know and see thus, should anyone say of me, thus he will end up in hell. The 
eight assemblies. Sariputta. There are these eight assemblies. What are the eight? An assembly of nobles, an assembly of Brahmins, an assembly of householders, an assembly of recluses, an assembly of gods of the heaven of the four great kings, an assembly of gods of the heaven of the thirty-three, an assembly of Mara's retinue, an assembly of Brahmins. Oh, I'm sorry, an assembly of Brahmas. Possessing these four kinds of intrepidity, the Tathagata approaches and enters these eight assemblies. I recall having approached many hundreds of assemblies of the noble ones, many hundred assemblies of Brahmins, many hundred assemblies of householders, many hundred assemblies of recluses, many hundred assemblies of gods of the heaven of the four great kings, many hundred assemblies of gods of the heaven of the thirty-three. many hundred assemblies of Mara's retinue and many hundred assemblies of Brahmas. <coughs> and formerly I had sat with them there and talked with them and held conversations with them. Yet I see no ground for thinking that fear or timidity might come upon me there. And seeing no ground for that, I abide in safety, fearlessness, and intrepidity. Sariputta, when I know and see thus, should anyone say of me, he will surely wind up in hell. And when the Buddha says here, uh, should anyone say of me, um, he is referring to the accusations um, we, we just heard about in the four kinds of, of intrepidity. Um, let me read the first one again um, as an example of um, what if anyone should say um, of the Buddha, they would end up in hell. So this was the fir first one from the chapter we had had before. While you claim full enlightenment, you are not fully enlightened in regard to certain things. And then the Buddha says, Should anyone say of me such a thing, he will wind up in hell. Um, and let's continue. Uh, the four kinds of generation. Sariputta. There are these four kinds of, of generation. What are the four? Eggborn. The eggborn generation. The wombborn generation. The moisture-born generation. And spontaneous generation. What is eggborn generation? There are these beings born by breaking out of the shell of an egg. This is called egg-born generation. What is womb-born generation? There are these beings born by breaking out from the call. This is called womb-born generation. What is moisture-born generation? There are these beings born in a rotten fish in a rotten corpse, in a rotten dough, in a cesspit, or in a sewer. This is called the moisture-born generation. What is spontaneous generation? There are gods and denizens of hell, and certain human beings, and some beings in the lower worlds. 
This is called spontaneous, spontaneous generation. These are the four kinds of generation. And Sariputta, when I know and see thus, should anyone say of me, he will wind up in hell. And this is again referring to the accusations of the Tathagata. The five destinations and Nibbana in brief. Sariputta, there are these five destinations. What are the five? Hell, the animal realm, the realm of ghosts, human beings, and gods. I understand hell and the path leading to hell. And I also understand how one who has entered this path will, on the dissolution of the body after death, reappear in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, in hell. I understand the animal realm and the path leading to the animal realm. And I also understand how one who has entered this path on the dissolution of the body after death reappear in the animal realm. I understand the realm of ghosts and the path leading to the realm of ghosts. And I also understand how one who has entered this path on the dissolution of the body after death reappear in the realm of ghosts. I understand human beings and the path and way leading to the human world. And I also understand how one who has entered this path will, on the dissolution of the body, after death reappear among human beings. I understand the gods and the path and way leading to the world of the gods and I also understand how one who has entered this, this path will on the dissolution of the body after death reappear in a happy destination in the heavenly world. It's kind of funny, um, they're not mentioning the angels here, um, which usually comes before the gods, so it goes from humans to angels and then to gods. I guess they just uh, kind of put them in the same category as the gods. Um, but let's continue on with, the, with number six. Um, the, the path of Nibbana. I understand Nibbana and the path leading to Nibbana. And I also understand how one who has entered this path will, by realizing it for himself with direct knowledge, here and now, enter upon and abide in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. And now we continue on um, reading uh, about the five destinations in detail. By encompassing, by encompassing mind with mind, I understand a certain person thus. This person so behaves, so conducts himself, has taken such a path that on the dissolution of the body after death he will reappear in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, in hell. And then later on, with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I see 
on the dissolution of the body after death. He has reappeared in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, in hell, and is experiencing extremely painful, raggedy, uh, piercing feelings. Suppose that suppose there were a charcoal pit deeper than a man's height full of glowing uh, hot coals without flame or smoke and then a man scorched and exhausted by hot weather weary parched and thirsty came by a path going in one way only and directed to that same charcoal pit then a man with good sight on seeing him would say this person so behaves so conducts himself has taken such a path that he will come to the se this same charcoal pit and then later on he sees that he has fallen into that charcoal pit and is experiencing extremely painful racketing piercing feelings and so too by encompassing mind with mind and piercing feelings hmm. by encompassing mind with mind I understand a certain person thus this person so behaves so conducts himself has taken such path that on the dissolution of the body after death he will reappear in the animal realm and then later on with the divine eye which is purified and surpasses the human I see that on the dissolution of the body after death he has reappeared in the animal realm and is experiencing painful racking piercing feelings Suppose there were a cesspit deeper than a man's height, full of filth, and then a man, scorched and exhausted by hot weather, weary, parched and thirsty, came by a path going in one way only and directed to that same cesspit. Then a man with good sight on seeing him would say, This person so behaves that he will come to this same cesspit and then later on on and late and then later on he sees that he has fallen into that cesspit and is experiencing painful racking piercing feelings so too by encompassing mind with mind um, he will come to piercing feelings I'm sorry, this is just a little bit strange to end th this. I'm not sure I really like uh, the way they're going here. So it says at the end, so too, by encompassing mind with mind, dot dot dot, piercing feelings. And what this means is, as you encompass mind with the mind, um, you, you can, you'll see um, in this case the Buddha saw with his divine eye how these two persons one headed to hell and one headed to the animal realm um, on a one-way leading road one-way leading path um, will have no way of uh, escaping the result of piercing feelings um, I'm sorry for the hiccup there, and uh, let me just continue. By encompassing mind with mind, I have un by encompassing mind with mind, I understand a certain person thus: this person so behaves, so conducts himself, has taken such a path that on the dissolution of the body after death, he will reappear in the animal in the realm of ghosts 
and then later on I see that he has reappeared in the realm of ghosts and is in experiencing much painful feeling. Suppose there were a tree growing on uneven ground with with scanty foliage casting a dappled shade, and then a man scorched and exhausted by hot weather, weary, parched and thirsty, came by a path going in one way only, and directed to that same tree. Then a man with good sight on seeing him would say, This person so behaves that he will come to this same tree, and then later on he sees that he is sitting or lying in the shade of that tree, it's experiencing much painful feeling, and so too, by encompassing mind with mind, seeing the result um, of the path to be <laughs> a much painful feeling. By encompassing mind with mind, I understand a certain person thus. This person so behaves, so conducts himself, has taken such a path that on the dissolution of the body after death he will reappear among human beings. And then later on I see that he has reappeared among human beings and, exp and is experiencing much pleasant feeling. Suppose there were a tree growing on even ground with the thick foliage casting a deep shade. And then a man scorched and exhausted by hot weather, weary, parched and thirsty, came by a path going in one way only and directed to that same tree. Then a man with good sight on seeing him would say, This person so behaves that he will come to this same tree, and then later on he sees that he is sitting or lying in the shade of that tree, it's experiencing much a much pleasant feeling. And so too, by encompassing mind with mind, a much pleasant feeling. By encompassing mind with mind, I understand a certain person thus. This person so behaves, so conducts himself, has taken such a path that on the dissolution of the body after death he will reappear in a happy destination, in the heavenly world. And then later on I see that he has reappeared in a happy destination, in the heavenly world, and is experiencing extremely pleasant feelings. Suppose there were a mansion, and it had an upper chamber plastered within and without, shut off, secured by bars, with shuttered windows, and in it there was a couch spread with rugs, blankets and sheets, with a deerskin coverlet, with a canopy as well as a crimson as crimson pillows for both head and feet. And then a man, scorched and exhausted by hot weather, weary, parched and thirsty, came by a path going one way only, and directed to that same mansion. Then a man with good sight on seeing him would say, This person so behaves, that he will come to this same mansion. And later on he sees that he is sitting or lying in that upper chamber, in that mansion experiencing extremely pleasant feelings. And so too, by encompassing mind with mind, extremely pleasant feelings. This is what the text actually says. Just a second. Um, <laughs> okay. Oh no! Don't don't even worry. Let's just continue.
okay so someone just dropped something off um, at my house <laughs> so uh, but let's just continue and I'm sorry for the for the disturbance here um, okay here we go by let me just see my sound is on yep okay by encompassing mind with mind I understand a certain person thus this person so behaves so conducts himself has taken such a path that by realizing it for himself with direct knowledge he here and now will enter upon and abide in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints and then later on I see that by realizing it for himself with direct knowledge he here and now enters upon and abides in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints and is experiencing extremely pleasant feelings suppose there were a pond with clean agreeable cool water transparent with smooth banks delightful and nearby a dense wood and then a man scorched and exhausted by hot weather weary parched thirsty came by a path going in one way only and directed towards that same pond then the man with good sight on seeing him would say this person so behaves that he will come to this same pond and then later on he sees that he has plunged into the pond bathed drunk and re relieved all his distresses fatigue and fever and has come out again and is sitting or lying in the wood it's experiencing extremely pleasant feelings so too by encompassing mind with mind I see how these beings will come on this path <laughs> will come to extremely pleasant feelings these are the five destinations Sariputta when I know and see thus should anyone say of me the recluse Gotama does not have any superhuman states any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones the reckless Gotama teaches a Dhamma merely hammered out by reasoning following his own line of inquiry as it occurs to him unless he abandons that assertion and that state of mind and relinquishes that view then as surely as if he had been carried off and put there he will wind up in hell just as a bhikkhu possessed of virtue concentration and wisdom could here and now enjoy final knowledge so it will happen in this case I say that unless he abandons that assertion and that state of mind and relinquishes that view then as surely as is as if he had been carried off and put there he will wind up in hell and that was the five destination and nibbana described in detail continuing on with the bodhisattva's austerities Sariputta I recall having lived a holy life possessing four factors I have practiced asceticism the extreme of asceticism I have practiced coarseness the extreme of coarseness I have practiced scrupulousness the extreme of scrupulousness I have practiced seclusion 
the extreme of the seclusion. Such was my asceticism, Sariputta, that when I went naked, rejecting conventions, licking my hands, not coming when asked, not stopping when asked, I did not accept food, I, I did not accept food brought or food specially made or an invitation to a meal. I received nothing from a pot, from a bowl, a crush, a threshold, across a stick, across a pestle, from two eating together, from a pregnant woman, from a woman giving suck, from a woman lying with a man, from where food was advertised to be distributed, from where a dog was waiting, from where flies were buzzing. I accepted no fish or meat, I drank no liquor, wine or fermented brew, I kept to one house, to one morsel, I kept to two houses, two morsels, I kept to seven houses, to seven morsels, I lived on one source of saucerful a day, on two saucerfuls a day, on seven saucerfuls a day. I took food once a day, once every two days, once every seven days, and so and so on up to once every fortnight. I dwelt pursuing the practice of taking food at stated intervals. I was an eater of greens or millet or wild rice or hide pyrings or moss or rice bran or rice scum or sesame flour or grass or cow dung. I lived on forest roots and fruits. I fed on fallen fruits. I clothed myself in hemp, in hemp mixed cloth, in shrouds, in rip, in refuse rags, in tree bark, in antelope hide, in strips of antelope hide, in coosa grass fabric, in bark fabric, in wood shavings fabric, in head hair wool, in animal wool, in owl's wings. I was one who pulled out hair and beard, pursuing the practice of pulling out hair and beard. I was one who stood continuously rejecting seats. I was one who squatted, squatted it continuously devoted to maintaining the squatting position. I was one who used a mattresses of spikes. I made a, a mattress of spikes my bed. I dwelt pursuing the practice of bathing in the river three times daily, including the evening. Thus. In such a variety of ways I dwelt pursuing the practice of tormenting and mortifying the body. Such was my asceticism. Such was my coarseness, Sariputta. That just as the bottle uh, that just as the bowl of a tinduka tree accumulating over the years cakes and flakes off so too, dust and dirt accumulating over the years, caked off my body and flaked off. It never occurred to me, oh, let me rub this dust and dirt off my hand, off with my hand, or let another rub this dust and dirt off with his hand. It never occurred to me thus, such was my coarseness. 
such was my scrupulousness, Sariputta, that I was always mindful in stepping forwards and stepping backwards. I was full of pity, even for the beings in a drop of water. Thus, let me not hurt the tiny creatures in the crevices on the ground. Such was my scrupulousness. Such was my seclusion, Sariputta, that I would plunge into some forest and dwell there. And when I saw a cowherd or shepherd or someone gathering grass or sticks or a woodsman, I would flee from the grove I would flee from grove to grove, from thicket to thicket, from hollow to hollow, from hillock to hillock. Why was that? So that they should not see me or I see them, just as a forest bred deer on seeing human beings flees from grove to grove, from thicket to thicket, from hollow to hollow, from hillock to hillock, so too, when I saw a cowherd or a shepherd, such was my seclusion. I would go on all fours to the cow pens, when the cattle had gone out and the cowherd had left them, and I would feed on the dung of the young suckling cows. As long as my own excrement and urine lasted, I fed on my own excrement and urine. Such was my great distortion in feeding. And this is from the time before the Buddha's enlightenment. And we're reading the section called the Bodhisattva's Austerities. I would plunge into some awe-inspiring grove and dwell there, a grove so awe-inspiring that normally it would make a man's hair stand up if he were not free from lust. When those cold wintry nights came during the eight days interval of frost, I would dwell by night in the open and by day in the grove. In the last month of the hot season I would dwell by day in the open and by night in the grove. And there came to me spontaneously and there came to me spontaneously this stanza never heard before. Chilled by night and scorched by day, alone in awe-inspiring groves, naked, no fire to sit beside, the sage yet pursues his quest. I would make my bed in a charnel ground with the bones of dead of the dead for a pillow, and cowherd boys came up and spat on me, urinated on me, threw dirt at me, and poked sticks into my ears. Yet I do not recall that I ever aroused an evil mind of hate against them. Such was my abiding in equanimity. Sariputta there are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine and view is this purification comes about through food. They say, let us live on cola fruits and they eat cola fruits. They eat cola fruit powder, they drink cola fruit water and they make many kinds of cola fruit concoctions. Now, I recall having eaten a single cola fruit a day. Sariputta, you may think that cola fruit was bigger at that time. Yet you should not regard it so. The cola fruit was then at most the same size as now. Through feeding on a single cola fruit a day, my body reached a state of extreme eman emaciation. 
because of eating so little my limbs became like the jointed segments of wine stems or bamboo stems. Because of eating so little my backside became like a camel's hoof. Because of eating so little the projections of my spine stood forth like corded beads. Because of eating so little my ribs juttered out as gaunt as the crazy rafters of an old roofless barn. Because of eating so little the gleam of my eyes sank far down in uh, far down in their sockets, looking like a gleam of water which has sunk far down in a deep well. Because of eating so little, my scalp shriveled and withered as a green bitter gourd shrivels and withers in the wind and sun. Because of eating so little, my belly skin adhered to my backbone. Thus, if I touched my belly skin, I encountered my backbone. And if I touched my backbone, I encountered my belly skin. Because of eating so little, if I tried to ease my body by rubbing my limbs with my hands, the hair rotted at its roots, fell from my body as I rubbed. Sariputta there are certain recluses and brahmas whose doctrine and view is this. Purification comes through food. They say, let us live on beans, let us live on sesame, let us live on rice, and they eat rice, they eat rice powder, and they drink rice water, and they make various kinds of rice concoctions. Now I recall having eaten a single rind grace a day, Sar Sariputta. You may think that the rice grain was bigger at that time, yet you should not regard it so. The rice grain was then at most the same size as now. Through feeding on a single rice grain a day, my body reached a state of extreme emaciation. Because of eating so little, the hair, rotted it as it at its roots, fell from my body as I rubbed. Yet, Sariputta, by such conduct, by such practice, by such performance of austerities, I did not attain any superhuman states, any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Why was that? Because I did not attain that noble wisdom which, when attained, is noble and emancipating and leads the one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction of suffering. Sariputta, there are recluses and brahmas whose doctrine and view is this. Purification comes about through the rounds of rebirth, but it is impossible to find a realm in the round that I have not already passed through in this long journey, except for the gods of the pure abodes. And had I passed through the round as a god in the pure abodes, I would never have returned to this world. There are certain recluses and brahmins whose doctrine and view is this. Purification comes about through uh, some kind of some particular kind of rebirth. But it is impossible to find a kind of rebirth that I have not been reborn in already in this long journey, except for the gods of the pure abodes. There are certain recluses and brahmins whose doctrine and view is this. Purification comes through 
some particular abode. But it is impossible to find a kind of abode that I have not already dwelt in, except for the gods of the pure abodes. There are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine and view is this, purification comes through sacrifice. But it is impossible to find a kind of sacrifice that has not already been offered up by me in this long journey, when I was either a head-anointed noble king or a well-to-do Brahmin. There are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine and view is this. Purification comes through fire worship. But this but it is impossible to find a kind of fire that has not already been worshipped by me in this long journey, when I was either a head anointed noble king or a well to do Brahman. Sariputta, there are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine and view is this. As long as this good man is still young, a black-haired young man endowed with the blessings of youth in the prime of his life, so long is he perfect in his lucid wisdom. But when this good man is old, aged, burdened with years, advanced in life, and come to this last stage, being eighty, ninety, or a hundred years old, then le the lucidity of his wisdom is lost. But it should not be regarded so. I am now old, aged, burdened with years, advanced in life, and come to the last stage. My years have turned eighty. Now suppose that I had four disciples with a hundred years lifespan, perfect in mindfulness, retentiveness, memory, and lucidity of wisdom, just as a skilled archer, trained, practiced, and tested could easily shoot a light arrow across the shadow of a palm tree. Suppose that they were even to that extent perfect in mindfulness, retentiveness, memory and lucidity of wisdom. Suppose that they continuously asked me about the four foundations of mindfulness and that I answered them when asked and that they remembered each answer of mine, and never asked a subsidiary question or paused to, except to eat, drink, consume food, taste, urinate, defecate, and the rest in order to remove sleepiness and tiredness. Still, the Tathagata's exposition of the Dhamma, his explanations of factors of the Dhamma and his replies to the two questions would not yet come to an end. But meanwhile those four disciples of mine with their hundred years lifespan would have died at the end of those hundred years. Sariputta, even if you have to carry me about on a bed, still there will be no change in the lucidity of the Tathagata's wisdom. Rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, a being not subjected to delusion has appeared in the world for the welfare and happiness of many, out of compassion for the world, for the good welfare and happiness of gods and humans. It is of me, indeed, that, rightly speaking, this should be said. Now, on occasion, now on that occasion, 
the venerable Naga Sammala was standing behind the Blessed One fanning him. Then he said to the Blessed One, It is wonderful, venerable sir, it is marvelous. As I listened to this discourse on the Dhamma, the hairs of my body stood up. Venerable sir, what is the name of this discourse on the Dhamma? As to that, Nagasamala, you may remember this discourse on the Dhamma as the hair-raising discourse. Let me just see if I can find the Pali for that. So the Pali for that would be Loma Ham Sanya Pariyaya. Pariyaya. Let me try again. Loma Ham Sana Pariyaya. And that would be the Pali for the hair raising discourse. And that is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Naga Samala was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. And this concludes the Mahasihanara Sutta, the Great Discourse on the Lion's Roar. And thank you so much for listening, and may you find true peace, happiness, and freedom from suffering. Keep practicing and reflecting. Thank you.